Stampton. Stampton. Okay, please uh, welcome David Stainton, who will to talk about uh, modern mix network design. Hello. <laughs> All right. So uh, for the past year, I've been working with uh, the Panoramics project. It's funded by the European Commission. It's a grant project to research and develop mix networks. And... Um, the reason we're doing this is because uh, metadata leakage is uh, very serious. Um, it can get you killed. It can uh, it can ruin your life. And um, some of these actor bad actors that are doing this have uh, stockpiled zero days, extremely powerful adversaries. Um, but I want to read you all a quote from the moral character of cryptographic works by Philip Rugaway. It says, mass surveillance will tend to produce uniform, compliant, and shallow people. It will thwart or reverse social progress. In the world of ubiquitous monitoring, there is no space for personal exploration, no space to challenge social norms either. Living in fear, there is no genuine freedom. So that, that's where I'm coming from. What do we mean by metadata leakage? We, we, we actually mean leaking all, all, all these things, uh, sender, receiver, send time, message size, all this stuff. So this, this is actually the secure messaging problem here. Um, cryptographers have uh, severely fucked up uh, because we actually don't have any tools to securely message each other at all. It's not about confidentiality or authenticity. That problem is solved. So this, this is actually the real secure messaging problem which is how to prevent metadata leakage, or at least how can we reduce it? Um, notice geographical location is up there too. Um, so all, all these could be very important. If they're not important for you personally, uh, this uh, does not mean that it cannot benefit other people in society who may have higher risk uh, situation than yourself. So why not a VPN? Um, so I want to start off this talk by saying I, th I want people to interrupt me if uh, you have any questions or if something doesn't make sense. Um, probably you all know what a VPN is. Um, so we're kind of going through the different possibilities of how can we prevent leakage and wh why is this a bad choice, right? This is terrible because you're, you're trusting a plain text intermediary, right? If your VPN provider um, is compromised, then... Uh, like, you, you have no privacy at all, right? But anyway, VPNs don't really uh, protect the thing we need to protect, right? An adversary can watch the incoming and outgoing packets to this VPN. It, everything's easily correlated by timing. So uh, how about Tor? Is, does Tor solve our problem? Um, so I maintain that uh, Tor is very useful as a general purpose anonymity system. Uh, I use it all the time. Um, you should too. Uh, but I don't think we should be using Tor for all of the different use cases we have uh, for preventing metadata leakage. Tor has a particular threat model which is uh, not suitable for all use cases. For example, can we message our friends? Um, if we uh, message our friends over Tor, um, can, can, can we be discovered who we're communicating with? or who is sending you a message, right? Um, and the answer is that uh, there's an awful lot of uh, attacks on Tor, um, in particular uh, timing attacks. Um, timing correlation attacks are kind of the, the most notable uh, attacks that, uh, that get cited in this sort of like academic context when we're comparing Tor to other anonymity systems. So. Um, Traffic goes in, traffic comes out. If, if, the, if there's easel, easily uh, timing correlation, so this, this completely breaks the uh, location hiding properties of Tor, the anonymity properties. Um, so in, in, uh, Tor was actually inspired by Mixnets. Mixnets were invented in 1981 uh, by David Chom, and his first paper this, uh, on Mixnets has all the big ideas here. It's got sender anonymity, anonymous replies, and... Uh, and, you know, like, uh, mixed nets have various use cases. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of 
research into this voting stuff. I'm not really into that. This talk is all about decryption mixed nets, not verified mixing. Because I, I feel that decryption mixed nets are much more practical. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about. This will be a pretty technical talk. I'll uh, give kind of an intro and an overview to a lot of mixed network design concepts. Um, we'll talk about attacks, talk about defenses, and then after all of this kind of mixed network technical d discussion, then I will uh, do a live demo. Um, and the live demo is actually uh, the Panda protocol, which is uh, used for key exchanges in Pond. So I'm actually uh, getting this to work over the mixed network. Um, so Alice and Bob can exchange a message. Um, so, Let's see. Let's 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 try to get this intuition about how mixed nets work. Okay. So if we have this, uh, so it, it's it's a packet switching network. Um, there's there's these routers that we call them mixes. Um, they receive input packets and then they send packets out. And the goal here is to try to um, create uncertainty for the attacker so that they cannot link the input messages with the output messages. We want we want to make this very confusing. So we have bitwise unlinkability, and this just refers to we have layers of encryption in our uh, packets that we're sending through this network. And when a message goes into a mix, the mix removes one layer of encryption. Now this means that the output message will be completely different in terms of bit bitwise linkability. It will not have any of the same bit patterns as the input message. Um, but Bitwise unlinkability isn't enough. If we have input messages come in, go out immediately, there's this timing, right? We need to add latency. We need to be able to um, confuse attackers trying to correlate these input and output messages by adding some latency. So um, 10 years ago or so, when uh, mixed nets were much more popular, um, people thought that mixed nets had to be low latency because uh, latency is one of the requirements. As it turns out, we can make a bit of a trade-off, and we can send some decoy traffic in exchange for having less latency. Um, what this does is uh, increase the entropy on the mix, so increase the amount of uncertainty. Okay, so we have bitwise un uh, unlinkability, latency. Um, here's a little uh, mix diagram here. So um, s let's, let's just run through a possible scenario here. There's dozens of mixed net designs. I'll just cover a few simple ones just to get an intuition, to get you thinking about how this threat model works. So say we have a threshold mix, um, a threshold of four. It's just kind of like an arbitrary rule to, to mix messages to, to create this unlinkability, right? So now a threshold mix just accumulates messages until the threshold is met, and then it, sends all, it shuffles them and sends them all out. It's very simple. So if this threshold is four, then the output uh, messages, there you have a, say, a 25% chance of suggesting that this particular message uh, in the output is uh, link, linked to the input message. You, you, you maybe have a 25% chance of getting right. Now, this is not a good safety margin, right? The threshold mix of four, it's, it's, uh, we, we need more like 10,000 or something, right, to, to really feel secure about this. The other problem. If this mix operator becomes corrupt or compromised, it's just like the VPN uh, scenario, right? This is why Tor makes multiple hops, right? You're, you're um, depending on multiple operators to hopefully not be compromised. Um, so that's an example of the mix strategy. Um, how can we break this? Let's let's break let's some break some shit. So I mean, I'll, I'll tell you guys about a lot of different attacks, and hopefully. We'll cover some defenses too that will hopefully seem uh, uh, plausible. <laughs> some of the defenses are partial defenses, so um, there, there, there's no 100% protecting any mixed network. Uh, we're always going to leak information. So one way to attack this is uh, kind of like ballot stuffing. Like if if I s see my target message enter the mix, then as the adversary, I can send a bunch of messages myself into this mix to cause it to fire. Right? I want to make this mix hit its threshold, and then it's going to output the messages. Um, now, since I'm using all these layers of crypto, the, the client is creating the layers of crypto in each message. I, I will recognize all three of my 
messages that come out, and this one message I don't recognize, this is the target message. So I've successfully traced the message from the input to the output of this mix. And maybe your mix network has several hops, maybe four or five hops or something, so you would continue this attack for each hop. Um, there's a, for, um, my friend Jeff uh, drew this picture. So this is sp supposed to represent a different type of mix strategy. So it's called a continuous time mix strategy. And this is uh, a little bit different in that these input and output messages do not directly uh, interfere with each other. There's not this statistical interference. Instead, each me message is independently delayed. And in this particular mix strategy, like uh, say the Poisson mix strategy, um, we, we, the clients choose a delay for each hop from an uh, exponential uh, distribution of random data, and um, so um, the uh, messages are all in d delayed independently, and if we want to attack this, what we do is um, we block all messages to the mix and, and wait for it to basically be empty, right? So once the mix is empty, now we can let our target message enter the mix and just wait for it to be delayed and then sent out. It's a, it's a simple attack, but this, this attack effectively requires you to DOS the network, at least in part, right? Because you have to, uh, you have to block these input messages. So we can defend, par par partial defense uh, would be to try to, can we detect when this is happening? Uh, can we detect when um, messages are not able to enter and then exit this mix? So there's one, there's one interesting um, uh, paper written uh, by George about 10 years ago, um, a heartbeat protocol to detect N minus one attacks, pretty cool paper. Uh, and more recently in 2017, the uh, Lupix paper covers uh, also this technique. So the idea is I can send a, uh, a message to myself, but it's going over the mix net, it's going through many hops, and it's coming back to me. And so this mix, it sends a, mi a message to itself. If it doesn't receive its message, it knows it's under attack. Some, someone is blocking these messages. Um, so th we've covered some little bit of the defense, um, but I can go over it again later. Okay, so, uh, um, but uh, our mix, aren't mixes just Tor? Isn't this just the same exact thing as Tor? And, and it's really not. There's a lot of confusion, uh, even in this community and other communities. Basically, uh, we, have, we have some kind of function that's causing the delay for each message. And Tor just doesn't do that at all. Tor tries to be as fast as possible. Um, if Tor isn't fast, that's a network capacity issue. That's a different... Uh, a different type of delay. It's not an intentional delay. Tor is routing messages as quickly as it can. Um, and this, uh, this paper by Claudia Diaz is actually really cool because um, they show uh, the kind of uh, functional graph of trade-offs for different mix strategies. So there's dozens of mix strategies. They all have different, slightly different threat models, uh, different attacks. Okay, so um, just to review, so we're, what we're talking about here is essentially a packet switching network. Um, this means we're routing packets and packets can get dropped. It's unreliable. This is fundamentally what a mixed network is. So any reliable mechanism we need to add on top. We need to do that ourselves. Uh, and as it turns out, rel adding reliability um, exposes you to even more attacks, which I'll go over later. Um, okay, so topology. There's different topologies. We can have mixed networks. Um, David Chom's first paper uh, introduced this cascade topology. This is uh, three mixes connected together in series. And everybody just sends their messages down this same mix. This is different than Tor. We don't actually need route unpredictability to achieve the security properties. So uh, why? Because each hop is mixing it with other messages, right? And anyway, we don't need route unpredictability, but we can use it. So um, what's the downside of this? It's basically that this doesn't scale, right? This doesn't scale for shit. This is a, if we add many uh, millions of people, I mean, we can't all use the same three mixes. So people think, oh, maybe free route would be good. But actually, free route has so many different um, uh, permutations of routes, it, it's intractable to to try to compute the entropy for each mix. 
Um, also, free route has slightly less uh, entropy on each mix because let's say uh, your, your message is using one particular mix as the end of its route and another message is using that mix as the first hop in its route. These first hops and last hops, they're distinguishable, right? Because where is the message from the first hop coming from? It's coming from outside the mix network, right? A client. So if there's distinguishing characteristics in the traffic, then we can use that to break the anonymity set into more than one bucket, right? And it really just should be one anonymity set on each mix, ideally. So um, instead, we, we think that this is a good trade-off. We think that the stratified topology, this um, is basically each layer can only communicate with the next layer. Um, so layer zero can only send messages to layer one. Um, and in each of these layers, we have multiple choices of mixes that we can use. So essentially what we're doing, we can send millions of people onto this mix network and they will load balance between these different mixes. So each user is performing some path selection when they want to send a message. So they select a random mix in each layer to be their path. They pr um, create this Sphinx packet with the nested encryption and they send it through the network. Um, so Sphinx, speaking of Sphinx, so why is it called Sphinx? First of all, um, the reason it's called Sphinx is because the, uh, it uses a wide block cipher called Lioness to encrypt the body of the message. So body of a lion, Sphinx. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is basically the state-of-the-art MixNet cryptographic packet format. There's no other contenders right now. Um, back in the day, there were some, uh, some other formats like Minx and so on, and uh, they, they just can't compete with Sphinx. Sphinx is clearly the correct way to do it. Um, and basically the way it works is you have, not only do you have nested encrypted payload, but you have nested encrypted routing information. So for each hop, you have a slot where you can have routing commands, and the mix that receives the message can only decrypt its routing slot for that one hop. And it get, gets some routing commands that tell it what to do, like delay this message or send it to this guy next or something like that. So this is, uh, but we can also build low latency anonymity systems with Sphinx too. There was um, a paper um, called Hornet. Any, anyway, it's, it's not important. But we can use Sphinx for more than just mixed networks is the point. Um, and it has a lot of cool features. Uh, one cool feature th uh, is the single-use reply blocks. This is pretty cool because I can actually um, compose a Sphinx header and then put that in the body of a different Sphinx message and then send it to you. And now you can reply anonymously to me. Um, so you can take the Sphinx header in the message that you receive and you can attach an encrypted payload to it and then send it through the network. And you have no idea where it's going but you just know that this encrypted routing information that's in the header, will, will, it will make the message get to where, where it needs to go. Um, and so, uh, actually, Nick and Roger invented SERBs uh, back in the day when they were working on Mixed Minion. Um, so, uh, does anybody have any questions so far? So when you have uh, the strat stratified strategy that you mentioned earlier, yeah, yes, uh, what? So does this model assume that all the participants are goodwilled, or how will you solve the problem of adversaries creating a lot of nodes where they will s uh, basically cluster into a single layer? Okay. Uh, yeah. Good question. I'm gonna take a drink of water. So this is actually uh, kind of um, a question, not actually about topology. This is more about the management setup and security policy of the mixed network. Um, so like, for example, Tor has a volunteer run network. So there's 7,000 Tor relays. Um, there's a directory authority system with uh, semi-trusted operators. Um, and clients uh, download their information from the directory authorities to learn about the network. It's basically the same with mixed nets. But let me, let me just um, mention that, so we, we are essentially copying the Tor directory authority model. Um, so we have a PKI, 
uh, basically what it does is it gives you a view of the network. So if you want to find out how to send someone a message over the mixed network, you need all these public keys, you need uh, at least the edge of the network, you need some IP and port numbers and stuff like that. So a PKI is going to give you all of that. It's signed by the directory authority. There's a voting protocol and so on. Um, okay, but that's part of it. But now, like, if you actually want to break the mixed network, like, can I just run a bunch of mixes and take over? And uh, um, and the answer is like yes, no, maybe. It depends uh, on the policy. So the way we're currently using our software and and um, setting this up is we're actually uh, having closed systems. So we have a whitelist, and that's it. The directory authorities decide who gets to be a part of the network. There is no um, uh, health checks or volunteer or anything like that. So it's kind of like um, put together a consortium of friends, set up a mixed network, it's closed, it's fixed. There is no um, Sybil attack or anything, any possibility like that. Yes? just wanted to add that uh, it might not be immediately obvious, but um, if you have one entity that is going to run a bunch of nodes, uh, you would want them all to be in the same layer uh, because uh, you have the property that for a given path, um, if uh, one hop is honest, then there's still some uh, anonymity. So uh, if you have like a bunch of nodes that you sort of don't trust, you put them all in the same layer. And uh, as long as at least one of the layers is uh, all good, then... Uh, you have something still. Yes, correct. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that you could detect uh, attacks by sending messages to yourself. Yes. Um, what strategies are there for dealing with those attacks? Like once you discover that you're under attack, what are some ways to, to deal with that problem? Ah, yes, yeah, good question. So in the scenario where we're trying to defend against these uh, N minus one attacks, the, the mix sends itself a heartbeat message. If it doesn't receive the heartbeat message in some timeout period, um, you kind of have two kind of strategies. Either stop doing stuff, which kind of makes the attack escalate into a denial of service attack, just stop routing messages, or the mix could send out a bunch of decoy traffic. And now the attacker's like, whoa, wait a minute, what's all this new traffic coming out of this mix? Now I don't know where my target message is. I don't, I don't know which one. So that's the idea. Yeah, do we have a question over there? So you also mentioned uh, for the reply or that the routing header is not connected to the message. So and that I could append uh, anything and yeah. I is but there's any kind of authentication or what blocks any mixer to just you know, have fun and switch messages and routing uh, directions. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, and this is important, right? We need message uh, integrity, we need uh, authenticity. Okay, so the way that's achieved, um, so normally in packet formats and things like this, uh, cryptographic protocols, we would normally MAC the payload, right? We would have some sort of message authentication code, right, in the header. Well, we, we can't do this in Sphinx, because we, we want a situation where I can give you a header, and I can't MAC what you're gonna put attached to it. I don't know what data you wanna send me. So uh, instead of MACing um, the ciphertext that's being attached to the header, we're instead, we're using a, what's called a SPRP, a super pseudo random permutation. It's a wi wide block cipher, which basically allows you to verify the plain text, not the ciphertext. So when you decrypt the body of a Sphinx packet, you can, uh, when you decrypt the payload portion of it, you can check the first few bytes to see if it's the same as your expected tag, right? So th this, but this can only happen at the end of the route. So m mixes can fuck with the packet and mess it up. And then later at the end, the s receiver receives the message. They can tell if it's been uh, tampered with or not if any bits were flipped. Um, any other questions for now? Okay. How, how are we on time? Let's see. All right, we have some time. All right. Um, so let's see. We covered some Sphinx stuff, and Leaf mentioned um, about putting nodes you don't trust in a particular layer. So we have this like layered topology, right? Maybe, maybe we can have many more hops in that as you wish. Um, 
so this uh, this uh, compulsion attack, um, it, it's one of interesting difference between Tor and Mixnets is Tor is actually slightly safer in the in this regard. So what do I mean? Um, if you capture some ciphertext, I guess you kind of have to break the TLS link layer first on Tor, but say you capture some NTOR ciphertext exchange. Um, can you then go to the the routers responsible for encrypting it and, and ask them to decrypt it or get their key? And the answer is generally no. This doesn't really work against Tor because um, there's an ephemeral key exchange. There's an interactive, uh, uh, multiple Diffie-Hellman interactions there. So the keys are going to be destroyed in a few minutes. Uh, for mixed networks, on the other hand, when, when you're sending a, a mixed message through the network, it's not performing multiple Diffie-Hellmans with an interactive protocol. It, it's one packet. So it's, it's message-oriented. So we don't really have perfect forward secrecy in a mixed network in that sense. Um, so, I mean, if you want forward secrecy, I mean, you have to do it at the next layer up, right? We can have end-to-end -end crypto with double signal ratchets and all that stuff, uh, but th that would happen in the end-to-end -end payload and not at the crypt Sphinx mixed net routing layer. Um, so, uh, these, are, these are kind of the three categories of compulsion that I was able to brainstorm. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of police raids. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, subpoenas, legal action to grab the keys, and uh, or, you know, NSA style hack the mixes and grab the keys. Uh, and then you can perform decryptions and at least break that one hop on the mixnet. Um, and uh, so our main defense is a key erasure scheme. And basically the way it works is our PKI, um, ha we have a, a rotation schedule. So all of the mixes upload new keys. It's all on a schedule, happens every three hours. So maybe if one mix gets subpoenaed, I mean, we're only gonna be using those keys for another three hours anyway. So we, we hope this, this reduces the window of opportunity for an attacker who's compromised keys to actually use them. Um, and this also I is why you might want to route your mixed messages through different continents, right? So if, if I capture a Sphinx packet coming out of your, your house, right, and I, I want to see where it's going, who you're sending a message to, I know where it's going, I know where the first hop is, because that's where you're sending it to. So I can get the, I, uh, angry dudes with guns appear, the mixnet operator is like, okay, I don't want to die, I guess I'll, I'll decrypt this, and then you get to see the next hop. Okay, so angry dudes with guns go over there to the next hop. They force forcibly decrypt the message and so on until the message is traced throughout the entire route. Now, if we have other types of key erasure schemes, we, we might be able to defend against this in the sense that we can make the window of time shorter. Um, and if, uh, if there's different jurisdictions involved in each of these hops in different continents or countries, then that means police agencies would have to coordinate with each other. It would become a logistical nightmare for the, for the man. That's what we want, is uh, make the man's job really hard. Um, so Jeff, Jeff Burgess, a uh, colleague of mine who's a uh, researcher of mixed nets, he, he uh, has been working on this alternate key erasure scheme for mixed networks. And what it is essentially is a forward secret mix um, which uh, George Genesis in invented years ago, but uh, basically, as soon as the mix receives a, a message from a particular user, it's using, instead of the public mix key, it's using a ratchet key. Um, and, and the key is destroyed as soon as the packet is decrypted. So it's, it is essentially an alternate key erasure scheme. It is not um, such a different tactic. Um, but there are very different tactics for defending against uh, compulsion attacks. Uh, there's, there's actually a whole paper on attacks, on defenses that have nothing to do with key erasure. There's like plausible deniable routing, um, multi-hop, uh, there's like, I mean, there, so one thing you might consider is if a message enters a mix and three messages come out of the mix as a result, now you're like, well, I guess I gotta trace all three of these. And you, you can do things like that. Plausible deniable routing is more like um, 
the message doesn't even stop at its destination. It just keeps going, and you're just not sure who's trying to receive that message. Um, so uh, there's also uh, there's other things to consider. So uh, Leaf mentioned uh, putting um, these uh, mixes that we don't trust in a particular layer. Um, Amir Hertzberg has got two really excellent papers where they have a completely different uh, security model, different topology. Basically what they're doing is trying to build up a reputation system of uh, different attacks or uh, mix operators that may have been lying about the connectivity of a link. And so what they're trying to do is um, build up a bunch of cascades, a bunch of routes that you can then choose from and you get them from the PKI, the directory authority system. And uh, that, um, that's a different kind of uh, threat model in the sense that like, uh, maybe your route is completely compromised and you use it for a whole week, so now you're fucked for the whole week. So that kind of sucks. But on the other hand, this is kind of better in a way because if I send you a message over the mixnet and every message I send you, I'm choosing a new route, well then I'm increasing the probability that I will eventually choose a bad route. Um, and so eventually our interaction will be through a compromised route. Um, so that, and there's no way around this, right? Either we do it this way or that way, right? It's kind of, there might be, s there's, sure, there's room for other models perhaps, but this is, these are kind of quite obvious ways of doing it. Um, here's a terrible, terrible architecture diagram. Um, this is, uh, so there's another class of attacks. It's quite specialized. Um, the idea here is that if, if you have a particular view of the network, and I know that your view is this limited view, then I, I can do fingerprinting attacks where you're building routes through here, so I know it must be you because you know about this part of the network. Um, these are called epistemic attacks. There's lot, kind of a lot of different types of epistemic attacks. For example, if you thought it was a good idea to use a distributed hash table for your PKI, I can just DOS one of the servers, and now I know that there's this missing, um, you know, instead of DOSing one of the servers, I, I, when you ask all the DHT servers for the, p for, for the different uh, pieces of the network view, I could maybe prevent one of them from giving their uh, information to you. Then you would have a partial view of the network. So any way you can force the client to have a partial view of the network, if the adversary is able to understand what that partial view is, then it exposes you to additional attacks where I, I know that these are your packets because you, they must be you because you're routing through only this part of the network that you know about. Um, so this is why we don't give out partial network information. Every client in the network must receive the full network view in order to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Um, so the ultimate sort of attack that we're really trying to defend against here is statistical disclosure attacks. And these basically work on all anonymity networks. They work on Tor, they work on everything. So the idea is that, um, so we can't protect against uh, this 100%. We have partial mitigation. So let me explain. So if we have a, uh, if you go offline, and certain correspondences that you're communicating with, uh, they now receive fewer messages, then I would expect that, okay, you must be sending the messages. If you're offline, you can't be sending messages during that time. So this is kind of, we can't do better than this in the sense that like, we cannot prohibit users from going offline. Users will eventually go offline, and, and this leaks information. Um, so, so what this diagram is kind of a diagram of this, the mixed network and there's input messages and output messages. But what we're doing here is we're kind of abstracting away the whole network as a single mix. Um, and this works on Tor too. You can actually break Tor using statistical disclosure attacks, but nobody would ever do that because there's other ways to break Tor that are more efficient. Um, so uh, if the adversary is able to predict your behavior, if your behavior is repetitive, so repetitive, predictable behavior is, um, is going to lead to these attacks. Um, there's kind of two kind of flavors that they come in. One is I want to watch uh, you receive messages, and I want to try to identify who is sending you messages. The other is uh, I'm, I'm watching you, and I want to know who you are sending messages to. So usually they target uh, people's sender or receiver profiles. 
And let's see. So I wanted to include this. This is from one of those mixed net papers, you know, that you read. I wanted to include this uh, diagram because these two shaded regions, yeah, right here and here, this represents the area of the network that the attacker must uh, watch. So the reason I'm including this slide is to, is to really rub in the point. It does not ha have to be a global adversary. It is a far less, uh, far weaker adversary than a global adversary. Uh, there's nothing global here, right? So this adversary can see users connect to the mixed network. It knows when they're online. It knows um, if they're sending information or not. Um, but the adversary might not know if a user is sending a real message or not. And that's called sender unobservability. And we achieve that by sending decoy traffic, right? So if you send decoy traffic, adversary won't know if you're sending a legitimate message or not. Um, so the Lupix uh, anonymity system, which our software is based on uh, this design, um, this paper published in 2017 at Usenix. Lupix employs three different types of decoy traffic and also traffic padding. Um, so we mentioned before the uh, mixed loops to, with heartbeat protocol to detect attacks. So that's one type of loop. There's another loop here, which is users can send themselves messages uh, through the mixed network. And the reason you would want to do this is if your provider, the provider is like sort of the edge of the network that is allowing you to connect to the mixed network that you're authenticating with. If this uh, provider is compromised, then they're obviously watching when you s receive a message. So if you send yourself decoy messages, now all of a sudden you have receiver unobservability, which is another really great property to have. The adversary, the provider, doesn't know when you're receiving a real message or not because you've got this, this periodic stream of decoy messages coming in your mailbox all the time. Um, and then there's one more type of decoy traffic, which we call drops. It's uh, basically to thwart the passive adversary who's watching the mixes communicate with the edge of the network where messages are queued. So drop messages, drop decoy messages. You, you, uh, as a client, you're going to sele select some random uh, provider on the network to send a message to, and it will just drop it as soon as it receives it. So this doesn't fool an adversary who's compromised the provider. It only fools the adversary who's passively watching the mixed network. So each of these de decoy traffic types have different adversaries in mind, right? With different capabilities. Um, and so here's, here's an example of, uh, okay, so the columns aren't la labeled, sorry about that. But this, this first column is like the edge of the network. These are the uh, providers, right? So this is Alice sending a drop decoy message to some random provider, right? Um, and it just got a little bit more complicated looking. Um, so the, uh, we can also use that same provider to send a loop. So Loopix has this, uh, this idea here that um, you want to send messages to yourself to fool your provider so they don't know when you're receiving a real message or not. Um, and we're, we're doing things a bit differently. Um, in, uh, and basi basically, we're, we're sending a CERB. We're sending a single-use reply block to the provider. And there's kind of like this loop service, kind of like an echo service, and just takes the CERB and just sends you a reply back. Um, and so that, that's how our loops are structured. Yeah, so it starts here, right? And so this, this provider is now sending a CERB, and providers can only send to the first layer. First layer can only send to the second layer, right? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe that is a mistake. Thanks. Um, I'll have to fix that later. Okay, so, uh, and we also have traffic padding. Um, so you, clients will periodically request their messages from the provider. 
and the provider will always answer with the same amount of data, whether you have a message to receive or not. Um, and so this is great because we can communicate when we're, but we don't have to be online at the same time. That, that would be kind of very limiting. So the providers are queuing messages for you. Um, we can also do automatic repeat request schemes. So this is how we achieve uh, reliability, right? This is the basic error correction scheme of the day, right? This is how TCP uh, achieves reliability as well. Um, but this also exposes the mixed network to active confirmation attacks. These are, um, it's, it's a really cool attack. Basically, you can, uh, do you want to explain it, Leaf? Or, uh <laughs> yeah, so this is basically the attack where um, if, if I can predict that there's going to be a reply sent, uh, as the attacker, I can just say, like, let's just make half of the providers have an outage now. And if the message goes to one of these providers that are down, then uh, I should get a retransmission, right? Because there will be no acknowledgement sent back. So, uh, I mean, we can kind of do a binary search. Um, so, uh, in order to do reliable uh, retransmission, what we want to do is randomize the retransmission time. We don't just send the, the retransmission as soon as we realized our timer has expired and we didn't receive an ACK. It's like, no, we, we gotta wait a while. Um, and ideally, we would like in the future to use forward error correction so that we can hopefully prevent retransmissions as much as possible because they're going to take a long time, uh, especially since we're randomizing the time here. Um, okay, so I mean, this is kind of like just the, the this is the Lupix Alice and Bob kind of scenario here. Bob's got some other provider. It's different than Alice. Alice is sending her message through the mixnet, gets queued at the provider, and, and Bob is just later retrieving it. And um, I actually really uh, dislike this model. Um, and I don't think it deserves to be called an anonymity network in the sense that like Alice and Bob are not anonymous. They, they know, like Bob is right there, there you are, and there's Alice, right? You have to address the, each other's providers. So what I like about uh, Lupix is that it's very flexible. We can easily change this situation to make really strong location hiding properties. So if, if Bob's computer is compromised um, and now Bob is the adversary, Al Alice may not know, so she wants to remain safe. Um, so in, here's the scenario here is that we're gonna exchange messages through uh, an alternate mailbox, not the provider you connect to, but a different provider we're gonna use as our uh, kind of like a rendezvous point. Um, and so if I, if I tell you to send me messages here at this circled rendezvous point, I can later collect them. I can later connect to the mixed network, send a single use reply block to that rendezvous point. And now that rendezvous point can reply to me, not knowing my location on the network. So this is how we maintain uh, strong location hiding properties. Now, there's uh, other ways to do this. We can actually make a bunch of different messaging systems design using single user reply blocks without rendezvous points like this. We can, we can do funny things with SERBs, but I really uh, don't think that's a good idea. And the reason is because SERBs expire. They're a short-lived delivery token, right? And they expire in a number of hours or a number of minutes, depending on your key erasure policy. So um, I feel like these, uh, these mailbox rendezvous systems uh, are gonna be much more reliable. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, interest from the crypto community uh, in mixed networks. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we, we can give the anarchists and the capitalists uh, both what they want. Okay, it's live demo time. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna move a bunch of stuff here. Whoops. And this one. So this is an example of a, uh, so if two people on the mixed network uh, want to send each other a message or do a key exchange or something like this, um, there's this protocol, it's called Panda, and Adam Langley's Pond used it, and it was great because you could write down a word salad twice, keep one for yourself, your friend has another word salad, right, this passphrase, right? And then you both enter your passphrase at different times, it's asynchronous, and eventually it, it performs the key exchange over several round trips. Um, so I made it work over the mixnet, so one person is gonna say a message, 
how's born hack? And this other side is gonna do, is saying something, something else that I wrote on the command line over there. Anyway, um, <coughs> and yeah, I mean, this is this is the hacker style demo. It's spewing a bunch of debug logs, and the uh, stuff ha stuff is happening. Uh, um, okay, so this one just sent uh, sent a query to the panda server. Um, this one's also sending a bunch of decoy traffic. Uh, it just got a reply from the panda server. There's the serb ID. Um, gee, I hope it works. It worked before. <laughs> anyway, eventually it'll slow crypto movement, slow crypto. Um, okay, so this one just received, yo, what's up, from this client here. So this, this, so notice this client actually finished first, and this one finished second. So anyway, that's the live demo. That's panned over the mixnet. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is there any questions? You said in the very beginning that there, that in your opinion, there's that no good way to send messages to each other anon anonymously. So you have talked a lot about punt. Is that something you use yourself or yeah. would recommend in any um, way? I use Pond. I don't recommend it. I think that the crypto is probably totally broken. Um, Adam Langley has actually told me in person not to use it. Uh, I, so, I mean, it's clearly an abandoned uh, software project. It's very sad. Um, but Pond is very inspiring, right? Um, it shows that people are okay with some amount of delay. Um, so I think mixed networks uh, can be the new pond. We, we, we can make a pond-like client for mixed networks, and it will have some really powerful uh, anonymity security properties. Um, so when I say it's hard, it's hard to get these anonymity systems right, but that doesn't mean we can't make a really good one. Um, it's just that there will not be 100% protection. Uh, there will be partial defenses, and Getting into that threat model, this intuition about this stochastic threat model is, is sort of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to like understand that it's, it's not 100% defense, but it, it could work pretty good for most people. Yes. This is not a technical question, but so I, I like the idea of anonymity, but I'm always confronted, okay, I have to message someone and I need to like have kind of an authentication that this is the person I'm targeting and also the reply is coming from the person I want. And isn't it something I miss on anonymity there? It's like how, how is the, okay, target person validation? that I need to know of some people they are who they claim they are. Yeah, I mean, so if we had a, there's different meanings to the word anonymity. Maybe if we have 10 people in the room, there'll be 10 different definitions. It's really, uh, we're really talking about traffic analysis resistance, but that's a mouthful and people don't know what that means, so we say anonymity. Um, and if, if you sent me an anonymous message, I wouldn't know it was you. So we then could not really have a conversation or could we? I, maybe if I see you post to a, a bulletin board and there's like a SERB, there's a single use reply block there, I could at least send you one reply. So there are, we could make these systems. Um, now if I, if I know who you are, your message could be authenticated to me. Uh, but to third parties, they n would not know you're interacting with me. So that's called sender and receiver, uh, and sender and receiver anonymity with respect to third-party observers. That's so, I mean, we, we can come up with these sort of English phrases to describe the security property. 
Um, all right. Fine, thank you. Let's yes. give a hand. Please.